Okay, so we are talking about deductions for and from AGI. I guess the first question is, what's the difference again? What's the difference in for and from? Yeah, what's the difference in for and from? And why does that matter? If you get a deduction, who cares where it's at? Above, everybody gets regardless. And below, it depends upon whether you're in or not. The other huge thing is, is that AGI is used as a number to phase out a lot of things. So what your AGI is matters in lots of subsequent calculations. For example, what have we learned about what happens with your rental real estate losses? They can be deducted up to 25000 but then what happens? They start to go away once your AGI hits hundred grand. So that's, I think, the only example maybe we've learned of so far. But AGI plays into tons of calculations. So it's important. Okay, so the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, as you've heard me say many times, um, took away a ton of itemized deductions because it raised the standard deduction so significantly. This was supposed to make our tax returns easier. Okay. Um, but in Montana, do you get to just ignore all the itemized stuff? No. No, it doesn't change our workload one little stinking bit because we need, we need all that data because we can sometimes take it on Montana. Okay. Um, the but other thing. Like Washington, it would, right? If, yeah, if you look at Washington, it would be another issue. Yeah. Because there's no state income tax. The thing that nobody talked about in the current administration or Congress is that this is all set to expire. Uh, if Trump were reelected, it is set to expire exactly when he's out of office. So it was always planned to just be there for the eight uh, for the supposed eight, eight years he's going to be in office. All this goes away. It all it all grandfathers up. Very calculated political. Because it's horrific for the economy, it's putting us, our deficit, it's exacerbating our, our deficit by trillions of dollars. And they also put numbers by having it expired. Oh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's if you understand this, it's so blatant. It's a, it's a, it's a, here everybody, let me put thousands of dollars in your pocket so you love me and think I'm amazing and the economy's red hot. But it's all set to go away. Yeah. And in the meantime, it's going to balloon our deficit, well, it has ballooned our deficit. And that is literally all of these changes. Literally all of these changes. Like now, with I that do. said, with that, yes, uh, yes, not the corporate tax change. The corporate tax change, those cuts down to 21%, was a permanent cut. That's not that Congress can't ever change it in, in you know, a subsequent uh, that, that Senator House of Bill. But um, so, yeah, so that's that. <laughs> Health savings accounts. You guys have seen all of these in payroll. What's a flex spending account? Let's just go over this super quick because you've seen all this. Before tax. Before what tax? Uh, Social Security and Medicare. Yes. So the first one, flex spending accounts, are they're free everything. You pay no fight, you pay no fit, you pay no sit. So it's like it really doesn't even show up on your W-2. Okay? Health reimbursement arrangements. This is when your employer funds a health savings account. Doesn't show up on your W-2, you're not taxed on it, they get to write it off. Just a benefit for you. Medical savings accounts, those were, they had a really small window in like the early 2000s. I don't know anybody with those anymore. HSAs are a huge instrument, a vehicle that lots of people use and are gonna to continue to use because, because why? High deductible uh, plans. That's what HSAs are filling in, these incredibly high deductible plans, right? Now, to, in order to use an HSA, you have to have what's called a high deductible plan. But they brought the number down that they call high deductible quite significantly. So lots and lots and lots of people can use them. It's only 1350 if you're single or 2700 for a family. And really, that's not high deductible at all in the whole realm of what you could have, really. Um, 
So the contribution is limited, how much you can put in an HSA a year. What taxes do you get out from underneath on an, HS, on an HSA? All of them? Just, just the income tax, not FICA. You do have to put FICA, you do have to pay FICA on what you contribute to an HSA. Um, the maximum amount you can put in, $3,450 for yourself, $6,900 if you're a family, and then I think you get like another $500 bucks if you're 55 or older. Okay? This is also kind of a nice vehicle as you get older. Uh, you, if you're maxing out your IRA contributions, to put money into these because they can... Mm, I'm saying this out loud and I'm not sure. I want this captured on tape, but uh, you can die with them. So they pass tax-free to your heirs. And I think that I think you can convert part of it to an IRA. I know you can start investing them once they're over like two grand, correct? You can invest them. Um, let's see if it says anything here. Yeah, yeah, you totally can invest them. That's like a newer thing they did. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so when you take the money out of your HSA, so I've got five grand in mine, and I have to go get, you know, have carpal tunnel surgery, and it's eight hundred bucks out of pocket. So I take 800 bucks out of my HSA to pay my surgeon. Um, it's tax free. Um, if I take that 800 bucks out to pay my uh, my car insurance, if first off it's included in taxable income, and second off there's a 20% penalty. So it really stinks to take money out of your HSA for anything other than medical, dental, pharmacy expenses. Um, and you will get a 1099 at the end of the year called the 1099 SA. Okay. These things are a pin to get into the software. I struggle with these things. And like four years ago, I maybe had three clients with HSAs. Now I'm going to tell you half of them have HSAs. So they're this, um, I think it's an 8892 or what do we report them on? 8889. Uh, those are just a pin. Okay, self-employed health insurance deduction. Tell me what you know about that without looking at the screen. Do you get it? How much? My pet grooming business earned $8,000 and my premiums were $14,000. Only up to the net income. You can only take your SE health. You can take, I mean, I pay for my whole family's premiums are $14,000. My pet grooming business only made eight. I can only take eight. The other 6000 can flow to my Schedule A as a medical expense. Um, then, yeah, you've also got to fill in this whole, this is just so goddamn complicated anymore. You've got to fill in this whole thing here. Um, what months were you eligible to participate in an employer-sponsored health care plan? So um, I'm planning on leaving the University of May to um, open my welding shop. And I'm starting to um, earn some money welding now. And I want to deduct my self-employed health insurance. I can't because I'm still under the university plan. So you can't deduct it in any months when you're in the plan. It can't exceed your net earned income. And then what's that next bullet? A long-term care premium. What the heck does that mean? It's premiums to cover being, they're called SNAPs or SNFs. Supervised nursing something facility. It's an old folks home with a sassy new 21st century name. That may charge you nine grand a month. Um, so you can't. So there's different levels of plans. If I want to buy this like huge platinum plan, like right now, technically I should be buying it. This is when you want to lock in between 55 and 60, 60 years old. Because whatever you, whatever age you come into it at, then your premiums are locked in at that forever. So I mean, but it's really hard at our age to be paying 400 bucks per person per month into the, what if we get Alzheimer's and shuffle off the front deck syndrome 30 years from now. But if you wait until you're you know, 65, those that 400 bucks a month turns into 800. And if you wait till you're 70, that turns into 1500 a month. I mean, I'm just making those numbers up depending on your plan. Does that also cover like if you have a 
have an in-home nurse and you don't like it depends on the plan again there's like really entry levels and there's really i will also tell you that a lot of these early ones have gone broke a lot of these early ones have become insolvent so shit i've been paying 400 bucks a month for 15 years and I'm shuffling around in my bathrobe with the ankle bracelet on and they go, they go belly up, you know, God, that sucks. Um, yeah, nobody I know that's not really, really wealthy has any idea how you stay financially solvent through that scenario. You know, you get a, you have a stroke at 60 and you live to 75. I mean, unless you've just got a, vault full of cash, I don't know a scenario where you're going to be okay. Okay, this all gets a little bit complicated. Um, where does your self-employed health insurance premium show up on your tax return? <coughs> Schedule. They don't show up on the C. They don't reduce your net income for taxable for FICA. What schedule do they show up on? I should find that. Schedule one, at deductions for EGI, right? So schedule one can have a lot of numbers and then you add them all together and pull them to the face of the 1040, right? Okay, now let's talk about IRAs. Um, in, in this, a lot of this should be reviewed. So there's traditional IRAs and there's Roth. Without looking at the slide, what do you know about those? What's the difference? Why would you choose one? Okay, do you mean the contribution or the distribution? Okay, which one is before taxes? Don't look at the slide. <laughs> I know, that's really hard. I put up the slide and then like, don't look at the slide. So the one before taxes is the traditional. The Roth is after tax. So I want to put in uh, six grand this year into my IRA. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Tax theory always tells you to save now versus later because you have no idea what's going to happen to the tax system later, right? So tax theory tells me I should be putting money into a what? Traditional IRA. I should take my tax break now and put the money in, let it grow. Do I have to pay taxes on it while it grows? No. And then when I retire, once I hit 59 and a half, I can start pulling it out, but then what? I pay income tax on it, on whatever my highest marginal rate is, right? And if I'm still working at 50, well, I'm probably not going to pull it out if I'm 59 and a half and working, but um, I'm taxed at my highest marginal rate. Roth works exactly opposite. So who would fund a Roth? I don't get the tax break now. What do you think happens to most people's marginal tax brackets? between their working years and their retired years. Goes down, clearly. I mean, nobody I know makes as much in retirement as they did working. There's a couple scenarios where that's not true. What, what could you imagine in a person's life might cause them to make more money in retirement? You're taking a loss on something else? Oh, I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah, I'm right. I'm, I've got a big old capital loss that I'm absorbing money every year in, sure. You have a lot of savings, um, lots of investments. I have lots of investments, enough that it's going to actually raise my marginal tax bracket. So bonds that come to maturity, then you're just redeeming them, right? You're getting the interest throughout the life. So that's probably not going to shift too much. The maturity thing is just where they, you give them the bond back and they cash you out, but that's not taxable. Um, so theoretically, whatever you had invested in the bond was earning you interest income now, and then you redeem it. You've got to put that somewhere. It's probably going to earn you a like kind amount. It might shift you a little bit. What about if you are my age and you've got elderly parents and you know that you've got seven figures in your inheritance? I wish I was describing myself. My mom and dad were farmers in South Dakota. Um, so that's one scenario. Like, do you know you're going to inherit? 
or I'm, you know, Bill Clawson at Clawson Windows, and I know I'm going to sell my business when I'm 60, 65, and, or carry it and get payments from it. So specific situations. So you have just a ton of like passive income, like you have a bunch of rental So why would that be different between now and then? Like they, I guess I don't know. <laughs> the, the question, yeah, so kind of the same as Brooke's example. The question is, is something shifting yeah. in retirement to pop me into a higher bracket? I mean, in your scenario, if I've got a lot of rentals and I'm like working on paying them off mm -hmm. and then the mortgage interest deduction is going to go away, mm -hmm. you know, if it's big pieces of property, apartment complexes, commercial buildings, yeah. did you guys just see that there's a $150 million commitment made by Chicotis yeah. yesterday? I'm excited yeah. because we might put this on there. I mean, Chicotis. wow. Uh, you think you don't recognize downtown now? Okay, let's like focus on the lecture though. Don't be doing the tax returns while we're trying to do this because this is this is all important information. Um, okay, so how much can you put in? You can put in the lesser of a hundred thousand or hundred thousand, a hundred percent of your earned income or fifty five hundred bucks, and then you can tack on another grand if you're fifty five or older. Um, if I'm married, okay, so say I'm single and I uh, am going to school. And I work very part time as a barista for four thousand bucks. How much can I put in? Four thousand bucks. Say the same scenario, except for I'm married to a veterinarian and he makes a couple hundred grand a year. How much can we put in for me? Into an IRA. Fifty five hundred. So the number is the lesser of earned income, or fifty five hundred slash sixty five hundred if you're fifty five or older. But if you're married, uh, your spouse can kick in um, up to 5,500. Uh, okay, so this gets a little bit complicated. Um, so probably need to get your books out. There's some tables we have to look at. This last bullet is gonna segue us into some calculations we need to understand how to make. So what it says is, if you're not able to make a deductible contribution to your traditional IRA, then you can make a non-deductible traditional IRA deduction. Why would I not be able to deduct my contribution to my IRA? Because you're high income. And either you or your spouse or both of you are part of your employer's plan. So I make 150 grand, my husband makes 150 grand, we both have the opportunity to max out our 401ks at work they don't want me also making a deductible contribution to a 401k. Okay. So let's see how that works. So just what you said, a traditional IRA deduction is dependent on the AGI and whether or not you're married and whether or not you are an active participant in your employer's qualified retirement plan. So um, single taxpayers, let's go to page 5.9. Um, your shoulder stuff, you don't mind. So there's three tables that we, or two tables we kind of have to look at and then a, um, another rule on the bottom, thanks. Okay, so first, right in the, uh, no, never mind the one in the middle, to the raw, let's look at that in a sec. With the one on the bottom that says 2018 AGI phase out ranges, bottom of page 2-9, two, two or excuse me, 5-9, so the first, so plan participant means are you in a plan of work? So if I'm single and I'm not a plan participant, there's no phase out. If I'm single or head of household and I'm in an active plan, between AGI, once I hit AGI 63,000, my ability to put the full 5,500 bucks starts phasing out and it's all the way gone by the time I hit 73,000. Is this if you have, like if you are over the age of retirement or you're actively drawing out your retirement? This is the working? Uh, no, this is, uh, no, you wouldn't be funding and pulling at the same time. This is like you or me. This is just funding. This is funding. Okay. This is how much do I get to put in. 
Technically, you, all of you should want to be putting in 5,500 a year, and I should want to be putting in 6,500 a year because I'm over 55 years old, right? I mean, obviously, that's desirable for all of us to do. But if I'm single and I make 63,000 or more, I start to lose the ability to do that. It goes away altogether at 73,000, and I'll put, show you the calculation in a second. Oh, yeah, no, I'm active in the University of Montana. It's wonderful. Okay. Um, then the next one says, so now I'm married and we're finally joined and we're both active participants in our plans of work. It starts going away at 101 and it phases up completely at 121. So that, I mean, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but if you both have, you know, a pretty good middle income job, you know, 50, 60 grand each, you, you're losing that pretty quick. If we're married, finally joint, and neither of us are in a plan, or no pays up. If we're married, uh, joint, and one is an active participant, and then it says, see no one below. Now the question is, uh, which person is the active participant, you or your spouse? So read that note one and tell me if you Parts of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even taking a step. <laughs> so basically, it's saying I'm married and one of us are in a plan. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out, we both want to put as much as we can in. Person that's not active participant has a higher phase out. Yeah, if if I don't have a plan at work and my husband does, I don't start to lose my ability to fully fund it until our AGI gets to one hundred eighty nine thousand. But only for that person that's not the active. Only for me. Right? I'm not in a plan. Okay. When does my husband have to start phasing out his fifty five hundred dollars? Regular. Right? The regular old one hundred one phase out. Okay. Good. How do you think? I this is a deduction for EGI, the Schedule 1 deduction. What, do you guys have a Schedule 1? Can we look at a Schedule 1 really quick in your book? I think they're all in the back. Or... Okay. So these are all the things of uh, the top half we work with, additions to income, right? Um, I think you guys have done some unemployment. What else have you seen? This is where our Schedule C carries to, blah, blah, blah. The bottom is what we're working on now, adjustments for AGI. And so far we've covered, line 29 is our self-employed health insurance deduction. And um, right now we're we're working on line 32, our IRA deduction. I don't like to call it covenants, but so the law, I know there's a limitation on how much you can make in the law. There is. We're, that was the table that we just skimmed over. We'll come back to that in the okay, future slide. Okay. So let me just ask you this. Where do you think you tell you seen this? Where do you think you tell the soft or whether or not you're in a retirement plan? Yeah. Remember you check that box or you have to plan in your retirement? So, and you check that, and then they calculate your AGI, and you try and take your full 5500 bucks. It's going to run these phase outs. So if you are married, filing for a and you're in like that weird, non-active, most popular right, right. if one spouse can start thinking that out, and I have different deductions for one spouse dealing with a different stuff, how yeah. do you put them all on the line? Um, it just carries from your input into the software. So you're each going to fill out your own IRA contribution worksheet in the software. And, you know, we're married, and your deduction ends up being 2100 mine ends up being 3100 It's just going to. And then when we verify them separately, we're going to see them each in our column on Montana. Okay. Okay, so Amanda's question, how much can you contribute to a Roth? The numbers are the same, 5,500 and 6,500. 
Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I stand corrected. It's not if you're 55 or over, it's if you're 50 or over that goes up. If you're 50 or over that contribution goes up. So let's look at that um, box now in the middle of, middle of page 5-9. And those are hired phase outs. So single, you start to phase out at 120. Married, five, and joint, you start phasing out at 189. They're not as concerned. Obviously, your higher income for Ralph, why do they have a phase out at all if you don't get a tax deduction? What do you still get? You get your whatever money you makes. You come out of college, you come out of, out of med school, and you start at 450 a year at the University of St. Louis Hospital, and you start put you want to put your 5,500 bucks a month away in a Roth, you're only 30. Think how many years of interest and dividends they're not going to get taxed on. And you're making 450 a year in USL. So it's not the tax benefit now. They don't want to lose interest or their taxes on all that interest and dividends for all those years. You were saying though when you pull it out, you have to pay on that, even though there's that growth, you still have to pay. Right, but it's been deferred for 30 years. You're probably at a lower rate. Uh, yeah. Probably at a lower rate, and they haven't gotten a piece of life in 30 years. Okay, so let's try this one. Um, Owen is 42, probably need to get your calculators out. Um, he wants to contribute the maximum to his Roth IRA. Uh, is that the right number, though? His contribution will be limited. Is that only Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So what the calculation is is the denominator in any of these is the difference between the range. So the denominator is what's the range of the face up. Oh, sorry. One thousand dollars. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, the range of the phase out itself. It starts at X and it ends at Y. So whatever, it, it's different for the, some of these different counts. So the denominator is the range differential. The numerator is how much above the entry level phase out number are they? And then they get back a percentage that's applied to the number they want to take that phases them out. So with this, then you say active plan because like if you have it three or four, but what if you have one they say um, you trade or follow or something, but it's not a through that's not an active plan. So you could contribute. You can only contribute to one a year. One plan a year. So four one case, four one three weeks, blah blah blah. That's you've got to have an employer to have those. I can't just be like me to be like, I'm going to set up a 401k. So the only way I can be an active plan participant is if I have a job and they have a plan that I can participate in. Okay. Then I can only do one IRA. I can't set up. I can't. So I'm saying, like, if you don't have an IRA, you can get one. Right. Um, but you decide to go to one and Why would I have an IRA to my one? When I have a 401k or a 403b? That's a 401k for, for, is for corporations. 403b is the same thing for a nonprofit, mm -hmm. and a 457 is the same thing for government. But that one, I think, is a law. IRA. So they can merge, I see what They can merge those entries, yeah, those, um, those instruments, like 457, 403s, 401, you can merge them with Roth IRAs or off IRAs or these, there's these new ones, I can't remember what they're called. Um, that's an active plan participant. So, okay, so, but you're saying that I can't have one on the side you, also? You, 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 yep, you can, you can. Okay. But you're subject to the base of I just have to pay attention to how many Yes. You, you have to pay attention to how much you make, and whether you're married, you're single, and whether you're only single. The denominator is the difference between the high and low of the phase out range. So for this okay. particular case, it starts at what 120 and ends at 135. So the denominator is 15. How <clears throat> excuse me? How far above it is she? Yeah. So a thousand divided by fifteen thousand. Uh, 
Um, well, you can use it doesn't matter. But yeah. So um, how does the book do it? Oh, okay. So yeah, it's six, six and one half doesn't have another. So um, how much this is how much capacity does she have left to take? Whereas the thousand over fifteen thousand would be how much does she have to phase out? So obviously, I would I would do it this way myself. I think this is more complicated from a calculation standpoint, but I'm emulating the book evidently. So she gets fourteen fifties. Are you able to write on one? Uh, okay. So let me explain this, and then I'll and then I'll put it on the board. I don't want to make too much going on calculation wise. So. Does she does she have to phase out fifty one thirty three or can she take fifty one thirty three? She can take fifty one thirty three. That should be pretty cl clear that she barely goes into the phase out range, right? So obviously, if you did the other, just the thousand divided by fifteen thousand, that would be what she couldn't take. This is what she can take. Go ahead. <laughs> Right. So this is the amount that she can take, 1415s. And she, in this case, she's only 42, so that's the amount you multiply by 5500. If she's 60, or if he's 62, all the, he still gets to take 1415s, because he's barely over the AGI phase on amount. How much would he get to take? If he, if his AGI was 140, how much would Owen get to take, or not take, contribute? Because this is the wrong. None. He's completely done. Yeah. How much would Owen um, be able to uh, take if he's uh, 58 and his AGI was 124? That's the difference between the high and the low in the range. So at 120, at 120 he starts phasing out, at 135 he's done. And then how much would he get to take if his AGI equaled 124,000? How much would he get to take? Um, that sounds about right. Can I get a second on that number? So, I thought you said that it was the base amount of the base amount. So the lower amount, then this is the price. So the denominator um, is the difference. The yep. It, so when I was verbalizing it, I said, which is the way I would do it, but obviously it's something we've booked it, so let's stay consistent. I myself, rather than this, I think this is a little more difficult to see, I would rather have said, how much does he face up? So I would have taken 121 minus 120. Yes. Just, just yeah, we'll do it this way. Just yeah. do it this way. Forget so what I said. I'm sorry I said that. 66? Yeah. Obviously, in this example here, if he gets 14 fifteenths of it, he doesn't get one fifteenth. And this was the 121,000 minus the 120,000 equals one. And the 135,000 minus the 121,000 is 14. Okay. I see. So it's just the inverse of it's just, this is easier to me, but this is what the book does, so let's just do this. Yeah. Okay, second example. We've got three minutes left. This is a traditional. Liza and Mikael are both 41, and they're very friendly and joint me. Liza is covered by a 401k plan at work and earns 96000 
Mikal is not covered by a plan at work, and he earns thirty thousand. And just assume that's all that's going on in their life, so that's their EGI. How much can each of them contribute to a traditional IRA? Um, Twenty six thousand between the two of them. They're both active participants. No, Mikal is not covered by a plan at work. But you could have one on the side still, and that would count. There is, I, I'm not clear what the side thing is you should be asking about. There's really only two things you got going on. Like if you're contributing to, like I said, like e trader or own flaw, like if you. But you what if you trade your That's not that big of a industry. I mean, I could have my own portfolio of $2 million. A Roth IRA. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're trying That's to what we're around. doing right here. That is the side yet. Okay, so that would make them act no, no, the active participants only at work. Yeah, so unless they're getting it through work, they're not active participants. Right. What we're okay. trying to figure out is how much they can put into the Into the money. side gig that you keep talking about, that's what these are. Okay. So when you say they're contributing to Jack White or Food Trade or whatever, that's great. The question is what's the instrument in that brokerage house? Okay. Okay. So let's just spend a couple minutes. I want to make sure you know how to do this. I know. <laughs> so you've got a situation where you've got one active participant and one non-active participant. So you're using the active one doesn't one. get anything. It will just take a couple seconds to find it. Okay. You don't mind. And then we'll yeah, yeah, you're fine. And then we'll look at it. And then don't forget your denominator is the difference between the high and low of the range. Will you ladies, will you ladies share with Kim the final time and then the black 2000 SAT? Can you guys have this? Tax returns due to okay, so what's the scene here? How much do they make together? 126. 126. So for the person, the spouse that's an active spouse, which is her, mm -hmm. does she get any? Mm -hmm. When did you start phasing out when you're married finally joined with one active spouse? 121. Once it gone all, all the way. 121 is the top. 101 is the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so she, they're over. She yeah. gets nothing. I'm sorry. Uh, what about him? He gets all of it. Yeah. Why? Because he is, his phase out 189 to 199. He's the non active spouse. So this actually wasn't a very good example because you didn't have to do any math, really. But you had to, get, you had to figure that out, though. Yeah. So I like it. No calculation. Okay, well that's what that says. All right, so everybody sees what's on um, on the, and I'll just read this for the benefit of Kim. So Thursday, the Chapter Four tax returns are due at the beginning of class. 
for uh, the client black uh, that moved from, where'd they come from? Nevada. Nevada. Um, they have put $3,000 or $2,000 of state income tax on that W-2. And then next Tuesday, which is October, Next Tuesday is October 22nd. The manual assignment number one is due and the homework for chapter five is due and then we'll be knee deep into chapter five tax returns next week. Okay, well, um, 